Montclair is an exceptionally rich in history during the town's earlier development. With its proximity to New York, it attracted many prominent notable leaders in industry and business, education and religion, social reform, science and medicine, as well as a large artist colony, all seeking the clean air of First Mountain and the rural setting. While other historic towns may boast of one or two influential residents, by the 1930s, more than 130 Montclair residents were listed in Who's Who in America. Today, the Montclair Rotary is repeating the Black History presentation upon request from Mayor Jackson, which was part of our own history series for the Montclair Rotary by Frank Godlewski. I'd like to introduce to you first Alicia Robinson before we get started, our president of the Montclair Rotary. Thank you, Linda. Um, I too would like to thank you all for attending uh, this presentation today. Um, a lot of time was put into it, a lot of effort by Linda Cranston, one of our members, and I hope you all enjoy it. Um, <laughs> Okay, is that better? Is it on? Okay. Okay, is that better? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Get a little closer. Um, I would also uh, like to tell you guys a little bit about uh, what the uh, Rotary International is about. Uh, Rotary is a service organization, and we are located in over 200 countries, and we have about 1.2 million members throughout the world. Um, we were established in 1905, and Montclair has its own club, which meets every Tuesday at 1215 at the Greek Taverna. So please feel free to come and visit us. Um, we have lectures on things that are going on in the community. Uh, we do uh, our best to help other organizations, specifically not-for-profits, within the community and internationally. And our motto is service above self. So please come and visit us. Um, I will turn back over to Frank. Okay. Is this, is this in the right spot? Yes. Frank, uh, Frank Gerard Godlewski is an architect, historian, and ar artistic director of Fells Briggs Studio. Frank was born and raised in Montclair. He is a graduate of Cooper Union School of Architecture. Frank lived in Italy for 23 years where he worked at the Milan Architecture Studio of Master Italian Architect Aldo Rossi and participated in many projects. Since returning to the United States, Frank has been a curator in the Oren Sanz Foundation and has lectured on architecture and local history at various venues in the tri-state area. Frank? Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Before I begin, I'd like to present Dr. Judy Miller. And uh, we're so uh, honored and privileged that the Miller family, together with the Rotary, have uh, made it possible to have a copy. Uh, it's actually the working model of uh, Don Miller's Freedom Mural from the uh, Martin Luther King National Library in Washington, DC. So now uh, we have this great event that we have this um, wonderful learning tool for education in Montclair. And it's also Montclair's tie. It's one of Montclair's important ties to American history. So uh, we're very, very pleased and very grateful that the Miller family and the Rotary has provided this to us, to the community. Um, I'd like to begin. Uh, this is an overview of uh, Montclair's black history. Uh, this practically is uh, just an overview. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to uh, go over any of the material who, to whomever, whomever is interested. And if you'd like to contact me through the library, uh, most of the wonderful uh, images and, and, uh, and information that you're going to see come from the library collection. So I'm, I'm more than happy to go over and, you know, go over the material and share and give my opinion. 
Uh, I've been working on this uh, for uh, quite some time. My interest is uh, just personal and a family interest. Uh, um, my mother uh, is an educator, and uh, her friends uh, have been very active in um, in uh, educational uh, sort of uh, history and and African American civil rights history. Um, we're going to begin with the Meadowlands. Uh, and, and history back to uh, 1625. And uh, it's sort of like a preface to the overview of Montclair's African American history, which is very, very important and, um, and part of American history's uh, you know, very important uh, development. So this is a very beautiful photograph, I think, of uh, the members of the uh, African American YMCA on Washington Street. This is from 1926. But uh, here we're going to go back to um, in 1620. Uh, our area was, um, oh, I had a thing. Basically, you see in this image, you see New Barbados. That was the Meadowlands. Uh, this is from the 1600s when New Amsterdam was being uh, developed. And uh, New Barbados was uh, a purchase from several landowners, several British landowners that came from the Caribbean. And uh, they were, uh, their intention was to set up plantations in New Jersey. and. Um, so in, let's say, 1625, we have evidence of the first 11 African, uh, Africans brought to work by the Dutch East India Company. Um, and that was in Paulus, Jersey City. Um, however, there were also free Africans that are documented throughout the entire time of slavery in New Jersey. So, um, in 1664, the British take over New Amsterdam, and uh, Governors Berkeley and Carteret began to subdivide New Jersey's land uh, based on the idea of creating an economy of, free, uh, of slave labor. And uh, they give 60 acres of free New Jersey land to any uh, proprietor who is bringing in slaves. So for every slave you were bringing in to New Jersey, to this economy, you get 60 acres of free land. Uh, then uh, in 1668, here you see New Barbados uh, in that corner there. Um, there's landowners from the Caribbean uh, who are uh, trying to recreate the slave system in New Jersey. Uh, it was failing uh, down in the, in the Caribbean, and um, so they thought they'd bring the economy, this sort of uh, business, up to uh, the, the new port of, uh, of, of New York. And um, so there were these big plantations established by the Berry family, the Schuylers, uh, the uh, Sanfords, Kingslands. Uh, and what's quite interesting to note is that they're all related for marriage. So it was like this big sort of business idea to develop New Jersey like that. And I believe not, not many of us really know that. Um, the early years of New Jersey, uh, New Jersey sort of considered a, a land of slavery. It had a very, very heavy uh, presence of um, slave power and, um, and legislation to protect that. But 
there were the Puritans from Connecticut, and um, several of them left with uh, Robert Treat because they were not in agreement with uh, the policies going on in Connecticut and farther north, and they were more um, they were more connected to uh, Puritan ideological ideological excuse me ideologically um, sorry ideological we would say in Italian uh, <laughs> ideology uh, so um, they came Robert Treat wasn't that um, you know he he had his ideas of you know how to develop. But it was basically Pearson who was a little more connected to religious beliefs. And uh, there was the, uh, I would say, the beginnings of the concepts of abolition. It just wasn't right. Slavery wasn't right. So there were people like the Cranes, who founded Montclair, who operated in this direction of uh, emancipation. So here we begin. Um, basically with how Montclair connects to this whole story. You have to realize that this is, this is really a first. These are the beginnings. So Montclair is connected all the way back until, all the way back till then. And um, it's very important development. Um, so we're in Bergen County, Bergen County has a very bad reputation for slavery. Mm -hmm. And Essex County is almost the opposite. Because you had figures like um, the Cranes, the Davises. Uh, you had Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr founded Newark Academy. Whoa. And he also founded Chase Manhattan Bank. So we had some very important Americans here then who uh, had begun this uh, this work towards emancipation. However, it took 204 years. <laughs> and that's because New Jersey's economy was based on free slave labor. So it, it took quite a while. Um, but then in 1791, this is information that's very interesting. It's very... Uh, unknown because of the scarcity of uh, documentation. But with documents, we can piece together that in 1791, the Bergen Meadows that you see here, and that's Barbados, New Barbados, is a 5,500-acre forest um, that was burned down. And it says in Chronicle that it was burned down by sheriffs in Newark. So that's all uh, that's really sort of uh, out there to uh, the public in terms of uh, local history of the Meadowlands. So basically, our local history tells us that uh, sheriffs set fire to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, the meadows and the trees. And... Um, in about a day or two, it was all burned down, 5,500 uh, acres. Um, I feel that, uh, and I've been working on this, uh, I, I've been very connected to the Meadowlands. My mother was in the, uh, you know, the Meadowlands Museum on the board, and they're all trying to do research, and there's not a lot of material. So there's just a lot of old maps that say New Barbados. We know, we know about the, uh, you know, uh, the, names, the Kingslands, the Berries, but it's not even documented very well that they're all related and that they were all had this tie of business. Also, the Schuylers that came later on, um, what we didn't know is that Alexander Hamilton's wife is a Schuyler, so that even ties it more together. Um, so, uh, my my uh, opinion as a historian or someone who studies history is that uh, the, um, the, the big fire of the Meadowlands is more connected to a revolt. It's a revolt from uh, possibly uh, uh, African 
Americans who are free, uh, former slaves, and abolitionists. There are other uh, instances before that in history, like the Schuyler copper mines being burned down. Uh, the Schuylers turned their backs on, uh, on black labor and uh, decided uh, you know, not to go with uh, free black uh, laborers or slaves. They, uh, they got uh, very inexpensive uh, Scottish laborers who were indentured servants. And, and then the uh, copper mine was uh, torched. So uh, that arson, we're not really sure where that came from. But there's uh, also other instances. Um, so, um, oh, and if you ever are on a train going through the Meadowlands at low tide, you see these big fields of water, and then you see all the tree stumps. They're still there. So it's, it's quite fascinating. Um, this is the Crane homestead. You know, the Cranes uh, who originally settled in Newark um, come up here. Uh, and they're um, basically, uh, Montclair was previously called Crane Town. Uh, they, they owned the land, the deed to the land, and um, they um, set up the business of creating Bloomfield Avenue as a turnpike, as like a toll road. And that was to foster the development of agriculture in New Jersey. Uh, they owned a lot of farmlands all throughout New Jersey. Uh, so basically, uh, they were an important family. And uh, they, they did have slaves uh, working for them. However, there were very important figures in the family who were abolitionists, who manumitted slaves, who did businesses with African American uh, freed slaves, and uh, and and basically that part of Montclair history, uh, you see that sort of like a Montclair is like a big safe house. Uh, if you were trying to flee slavery, you would come up from the south and then uh, get to Montclair from the west. And what you, your destination was Jersey City to take a boat to New York because slavery, you know, New York was a free slave state. New Jersey was one of the last to abolish slavery. Oh, um, also I wanted to mention that the Crane House, here we'll go back to uh, uh, there's a tunnel that goes from the Crane House down to uh, the Davis Homestead in Bloomfield. And that property is on the Mars Canal. And we know later on that Mars Canal was used by uh, Underground Railroad activities uh, trying to get people to freedom to Jersey City. So uh, if they could somehow get to Montclair, it was safe. And you would just go through these tunnels and uh, there were safe houses, uh, very important safe houses in Montclair. Uh, so uh, this is a fact that the Davis homestead, the Davises were also abolitionists. They were very important. They founded the, uh, the church in Bloomfield on the green. They owned the land that they gave to the town for the green. Um, Alexander Jackson Davis is um, grandson of Deacon Davis, and he founded Llewellyn Park. Uh, he was an architect that did the New York Stock Exchange building and uh, part of Washington Square Park. Um, he, uh, his first house is in Glen Ridge, and uh, he um, is a Crane family member. Her, his grandmother is Crane, and uh, had a, he had a very wealthy uh, client, Llewellyn Haskell, who owned the uh, bas basically the biggest business in chemical uh, pharmaceuticals. His company became Merck. He developed Merck. He brought Mr. Merck over. Uh, so uh, uh, he was quite important as an abolitionist. And uh, the Davis Homestead is there. So 
it, today it's the, uh, I believe it's called the Bloomfield Steakhouse. It's on, uh, Frank, where is the crane? This is the corner of uh, Claremont Avenue. That's the oldest road. That's one of the oldest roads. And Valley Road, it's on a corner. It's been demolished in the 20s. And uh, basically, all that's left is the carriage house of uh, the Georgian Inn that is a little replica of what that looked like. So the carriage house of the Georgian Inn that's still there is a replica of this whole thing. Um, but that's where it is. There's a, a stone marker. Now, what's also significant is that uh, going up uh, to Crane's Gap, and that's the top of Bloomfield Avenue, uh, there's a tunnel that uh, exists from Upper Mountain Avenue, all, and it goes under Crane's Gap and lets out at the Annan Flag Factory. It was a test bore for a train tunnel that was going to be built from Montclair to Bhutan. And uh, they abandoned the project in 1878. But this was on land that the Howes owned, James Howe, the freed slave, uh, given to him by uh, Nathaniel Crane, General Nathaniel Crane, who manumitted him. And in his uh, last will and testament, leaves six acres of his best property in Montclair on Upper Mountain Avenue. And um, so there's a story there that we're working on. And, you know, a story about freedom and abolition, and it's all quite very interesting. We'll, we'll see more. So, uh, Major Crane's 1831 Last Will and Testament grants freedom, land, and businesses to James Howe and his heirs, who is an African-American, and uh, properties in Montclair, Caldwell, and a ferry boat business and bridge in the Meadowlands. So that's also quite interesting. And also, it's not easy to document African American history because there's big voids. And a lot of the uh, activity was not really lawful under you know, legislation in those years, so it had to be done, uh, you know, alternatively. And that's why we don't have a lot of documents. And the documents that we do have connect the story together, which is quite important. Here you see at the top, Crane's Gap, you see the turnpike, and that's Bloomfield uh, Avenue running into it. And then the old road is, is uh, Claremont Avenue. Here you see the Crane property and James Howe. This would be Upper Mountain Avenue right here. It's also curious to think that uh, an adjacent property was uh, Lucy Stone's property, uh, uh, you know, from the suff uh, suffragette movement, suffragist movement. And uh, a frequent visitor of hers was Julia Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Public. So we don't really know what connection that is, but we do know that they're connected as abolitionists. This is the uh, Last Will and Testament. It's high of uh, Major Crane, and it's uh, Nathaniel Crane, and it's highlighted all of the items, all of the language pertaining to his. Uh, manumission of James Howe and the gifts of land and businesses. And it's quite fascinating because what he gave to what General Howe, I mean General Crane, gave to James Howe was more valuable than what he left to his family members. Um, I've transcribed that. Now th this um, presentation is I'm, I'm going to donate it to the library, so anyone that would like to develop it or uh, would like more information would like to meet me here, but I, I basically have translated a lot of the material, I've transcribed it. So here we see, um, you know, naming James Howe, uh, and he also gives him $400, which 
quite a considerable amount of money in 1831. It's basically equivalent to what he, what uh, uh, Major Crane is leaving to uh, his family members. So it raises, it raises questions, you know, how, about the uh, James Howe. Where did he come, come from? from? How is he connected to the Crane family? Uh, I work with a historian named Beverly Crafazzi, uh, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately. Uh, for me, she's the best. She's also a Crane family descendant, and is very, very interested in uh, correctly documenting uh, her family history, and Montclair history, and, um, and local African American history. So we're going to be doing a presentation on Thursday at the Cordell Library. Beverly is a commissioner with me in Caldwell with Historic Preservation. So she uh, brings to light these documents where uh, James Howe in the 1840 and in the 1850 uh, censuses uh, lives on Claremont Avenue, Claremont Avenue in the house that he was, uh, that was full to him and uh, his wife as well. And um, we know that he has a son and a daughter. And the daughter is uh, married with the uh, Oliver family, who have always owned the uh, freed slave house, the James Howe house, until recently. Uh, but they actually, the Oliver family, actually sold a portion of their property to the Welsh family, the Welsh Wiggins family of Welsh Farms, and they built that mansion on the corner of Upper Mountain Avenue and Claremont with the round portico. And uh, Mrs. Blanton Welsh was very interested and concerned with properly documenting the Howe uh, history. So she's the first person that started doing that. And she also paid for the uh, renovation of the um, of the James Howe house to you know what it is today. She preserved it into the history. Um, so these are Beverly Crafazzi's notes of all of the documentation. Uh, she says, James was married to Susan, and his record suggests that they had two children, a daughter and a son, both between 1805 and 1815. Combining with this data in the 1850 census, um, so basically what we're working on now is connecting the various how families that are prominent in Montclair at that moment because uh, we also have house that are working together in businesses of farm development with uh, the Crane family. I'm sure you've all seen the James Howe house. The James Howe house is actually, I believe, the oldest uh, surviving property uh, from the revolutionary period in Montclair. This is the documentation, it's historical uh, features that uh, from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection who recognizes it as a historic resource. But um, what you see in that striped line is a train tunnel, and that's underground. Uh, the test bore is supposedly still there. Um, you could get into that tunnel. It, this goes right under James House property. Um, and it was the playing field on Upper Mountain Avenue that now Montclair Kimberly Academy owns. But there was the opening, when I was a child and I went to Montclair Academy, there was the opening of that tunnel there, right next to the carriage house. So I saw that at least twice a day all my life going to school. Um, and there are people in town that, that know a lot more about it. They were a little older than me. They were too scared to go. <coughs> um, I apologize for the quality of this image, but I've been working on identifying uh, possible uh, sites in Montclair that were used in the Underground Railroad or for uh, safe houses or um, 
I consider Montclair to be like a big safe house, even though you know we know that there was a lot of discrimination and the town has always been very segregated. But there's been this very strong presence of uh, abolition, and uh, from the important landowners in town. So I've I've identified about eleven sites that I know of. Um, like 8 South Mountain Avenue, uh, where the stagecoach house is. And there's a tunnel that goes under Bloomfield Avenue and goes towards the uh, Crane property and the, and the James Howe house, the Freed Slave house. So we know there's a tunnel that goes there. So basically, you know, you could go from the Howe property or the Crane property, property go under uh, you know, to the stagecoach house and secretly get on a stagecoach that would take you to uh, the port. Um, very interesting. This is a uh, the McKim Nichols Cottage in Llewellyn Park by Alexander Jackson Davis, who was an abolitionist and one of the designers of Llewellyn Park. Llewellyn Park uh, basically was founded as a community of like-minded and spiritual individuals. And they also were very powerful and had a lot of money because they were heads of uh, you know, industry, well, the beginnings of industry at that time. Uh, Mr. Haskell, family Merck, um, and then later on there were you know, all the industrialists who purchase properties there, but basically it's founded as a, an abolitionist um, community, and from this house, I'm sorry I don't have a picture of the other side of it, but there's this huge oriel window with pentagram that uh, you understand that if it was lit up you could see it for miles. So this house was sort of like a, a beacon, and uh, all of those roof lines sort of trick you when you're in there because when you go upstairs to that big room with the gothic window, uh, all of the boiserie, all of the woodwork are hidden panels and then behind them there are very big spaces that could actually uh, hold a lot of people if they had to hide. So it's fascinating. Uh, the tunnels have been documented um, recently uh, by uh, the head of the Llewellyn Park Historical Committee, Bill Westheimer, who's actually my brother-in-law. And uh, so they were able to open up the tunnels for a day, document them, and then close them again for further research. But the tunnels go from uh, a, a brook. So you could walk up through West Orange or walk down or whatever. There's a brook, and then the opening to the tunnel, and then you go for another maybe three-quarters of a mile underground and end up in this property. This is Henry Howe. Now, this isn't, I'm just uh, allowing you a glimpse of this. This is what we're working on, is to connect the Howes to James Howe, who is the freed slave. Um, but in the, in the next generation, you have Henry Howe, who is the founding board member of Llewellyn Park. Don't forget, it's uh, intentionally an abolitionist, abolitionist community of illuminated, like-minded people that's in their mission. Um, and Henry Howe is a descendant of a Scottish immigrant, James Howe, who comes to America with the Cranes and with Robert Tree in the 1600s. So that's quite interesting. Uh, this is what we're working on to try to uh, Established this connection formally, uh, I do know descendants of the Howe family personally. Uh, and they talk about the black branch of their family. Uh, they uh, live on Park Avenue in New York. They own, uh, I believe, the, I don't believe it's a patent, or they own the concession of the homogenization of milk. Uh, they owned a lot of dairy farms. and. Uh, so uh, they do, in their family narrative, talk about the black branch of their family. What I'm trying to do with Everly Profosity is to reconnect them with documents 
But um, I also feel that the gentleman uh, that you see in the photograph, uh, to me, could this isn't a photograph, this is a, an engraving from a photograph, but um, I would think, you know, with, in my opinion, that he is of a diverse background. Yeah. So, uh, and you would read him. So, uh, he basically worked with the uh, Crane family in farm real estate development. It could have possibly been that the Crane family had a business, a freedom business, you know, sort of sponsoring people to become, you know, citizens of Montclair and free, people coming from the South. Uh, you know, we know how immigration works in the United States, and, you know, with European immigrants, that's how it worked, through sponsoring pay them back, you know, your sponsors, and that could possibly be one of the businesses that they did. Um, here you see, uh, this is Eagle Rock Avenue, this is Llewellyn Park. Llewellyn Park extended all the way north to Llewellyn Road in Montclair, and that was the first part of Llewellyn Park, that's the oldest part. Um, now, today, it's a neighborhood of smaller houses. I believe it was developed to uh, provide houses for the workers of the Edison laboratories. Thomas Edison lived in Llewellyn Park. Um, but here, before it's subdivided, you see the East View Garden poultry farms owned by Henry B. Howe. And uh, basically, what we see today, if you see this, and H.B. Howe, this, you know, this has been subdivided already. Uh, from Orange Road, we have Howe Street, and that was this. So you probably are familiar with that location in Montclair. Excuse me, Frank? Yes. Is there any relation between this Llewellyn Park and the Llewellyn Park in West Orange? Yes, that's what it is. Oh, it is? It's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Llewellyn Park, uh, began on Llewellyn Road in Montclair. Okay. And you still see in the Stonebridge section, you have the roads that yeah. Calvert Vaux designed. Because he was a Swedenborgist, and he felt that all roads had to be following the natural, natural landscape. That was a big sect of the, of the founders of Llewellyn Park. They were Swedenborgists. Mm -hmm. And they believed that nature was divine, and so was art, and art and nature were very related. So when you were designing something, you would um, basically uh, follow nature. And that's why roads in the Wellen Park are like that. Uh, the roads of uh, Calvert Fox designed the roads in Central Park. And Central Park is uh, considered, I love to tell the story, it's a big Georgianist painting. That's what Central Park is. And because Frederick Law Olmsted loved Georgianist's work, and the Hudson River Valley School, he thought that the best park for a new American city would be like uh, something that preserved what the original raw nature was, because American nature was new, it was different, it wasn't like European nature. It was, they consider it fabulous and very evocative. And so the idea of Central Park is that Olmsa takes a big Georginus painting of what the land looked like and puts it in the middle of the developing city. And he thought that every city from Boston to Washington should do this, and that the cities could develop however they wanted to uh, around these uh, sort of preserved pieces of nature, and that each city would be connected by a parkway to go from one park to another. So that's where that term was invented. It was invented by Davis. So uh, basically what I wanted you to know was that the, the south end of Montclair, the Stonebridge area, was a piece of the Llewellyn Park. And because Mr. Haskell was so excited about Llewellyn Park and how beautifully it was coming, he spent so much money on trees and landscaping uh, that he sold off this part of, uh, of the park. And one of the first houses in Llewellyn Park, but it's off Llewellyn Road, it's no longer Llewellyn Park, is this house, which is very curious because if you look at it like this or from the street, you really can't tell.
but it's one of the most amazing neoclassical villas. Um, it was owned by um, uh, the house. Uh, it was owned by uh, oh. Samuel. Samuel, yes. It was owned by Samuel Howe and his wife. He spells it the same way as our James Howe spells it sometimes. It's either spelled Howe uh, with a W to core or Howe with an E. So, um, uh, this, the Howes sell the house in 1899 to uh, Charles Platt's brother. He's the famous uh, Long Island Gold Coast um, mansion sort of uh, architect. Uh, he worked for all of the important you know, Vanderbilt's and, and that's in Long Island, the Long Island Gold, Gold Coast. This house is absolutely remarkable. Um, here it is on the uh, Department of Environmental Survey as a historical resource. But also um, another connection is that uh, Joseph Howe is a uh, member of the Montclair artist community and that was fostered by Llewellyn Haskell and all the people from Llewellyn Park uh, and uh, his house is described as his studio in his house is described as being a very whimsical uh, sort of uh, interesting piece of architecture, and that's the same way that this house is described. So I believe that, uh, I haven't connected it yet, but Samuel Howe, here you see in the lower right-hand corner, and his wife Phoebe Howe passed the deed over to um, the, uh, uh, the family that, you know, then the Platt family, that makes it into this amazing sort of neoclassical uh, piece of architecture. And what's also very curious to me is that when I see, you see them all the time, but uh, it wasn't really possible for an African American to own property uh, in New Jersey until, uh, you know, the, the Equal Rights Amendment, even until the 1960s, there was uh, covenants and neighborhoods and things like that that prevented African Americans to purchase properties. But here, what's interesting about this deed is that Mr. Howe buys the, the house, you know, a few years before that for a dollar, and then he sells it for a dollar, and then it's co-signed by old sheriffs and banks and the, the you know, cranes. So it, it leads you to believe that it it's, um, wasn't very easy to do that then. Um, there's a wonderful document by Uncle Anthony Thompson who was a former Montclair slave, and um, he gives a very, very, very good narrative description of Bergen County and the difference, you know, the, the slave situation in Bergen County was very rough, very violent. It was uh, different in Essex County. And uh, this could be an entire, like, three-day presentation in itself. It's amazing, this document. Uh, but I also, in my own memory, in my own lifetime, there was a Dr. Thompson who was African American who had a house on uh, the, uh, on Orange Road, and uh, that property is now a playing field, the Immaculate Conception playing field. But it was originally the Baldwin Estate, and he had purchased it in the early 1900s, and uh, that's all I really know. And that it was lost with a fire, but that whole row of houses on both sides were, um, in the early 1900s, they were owned by prominent African-American families from Montclair, like the Dardens and um, the Thompsons. Um, this I'm not going to go over, but it's just a 240-year timeline of the situation in New Jersey from slavery to emancipation for the African. And uh, Cheryl uh, Jennifer LaRoche is an excellent American historian who is one of the first who is bringing to light this information of how a lot of abolitionist activities and a lot of emancipation 
uh, activities were basically generated in the African American community. It wasn't because there were, you know, a lot of abolitionists and you know, good-minded abolitionists who were working on that. It was basically, you know, a lot of work from the black community to work towards emancipation and abolition. So, you know, if, if anyone would ever like to go over any of this material with me, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, each year is practically a presentation in itself, so I just wanted you to have this overview. So, um, this is a family in Montclair. I love this photograph. Uh, I really don't know much about it, um, but I, uh, I think it's from about 1890. Just beautiful. This is such important American history. So, the, in Montclair, there was uh, the African American YMCA and YWCA. They're very, very, very important American uh, institutions. Uh, there was uh, Mr. Bullock, we have the Bullock School here. Um, basically, he was setting up, he was organizing these institutions in the United States. Montclair is the second African-American YMCA in the United States. Um, and it's a lot, it's just so important to American history when you see all of the things that were going on. They also gave uh, Don Miller's first uh, exhibition as a child, his art exhibition. Um, so uh, Charles Harmon Bullock was a prominent leader, and the, in 1990, the National Office of the YMCA decided to create the Colored Man's YMCA. Now, um, this is all really about segregation, but it was like uh, almost like segregation by choice uh, on the side of Mr. Bullock, who felt that um, uh, it was necessary to have uh, a black YMCA and YWCA because normally the school systems would fail in providing adequate education to African American students who were prevented, really. Uh, you know, uh, women couldn't stay on the property of the normal school that later became Montclair State University if they were African American. So it was the YMCA who actually allowed them place to live that was safe and they could go to school. So it was sort of like segregation by choice because it was almost like the black community doing a better job than what there was available. So that here, you know, we go into the um, specifics of the founding. So um, this is the Washington Street YMCA, it's a photograph from 1926. The building facade is magnificent. I really wish that they could have maintained it as a monument when they built the new school. Uh, it was built over a, a Methodist Episcopalian uh, African American cemetery. And uh, I'm just so enamored with these photographs. They're just so beautiful. This is a photo from, it's a very important organization in our community. Um, had the pool. This is just a study, if somebody would like to know more about it, on the segregation of pools in Montclair. This is the Israel Crane House, which is now the, um, uh, the it's a historical research center now. It was formerly the Montclair Historical Society. It was moved uh, to its current place on Orange Road, but where it was right now, uh, where it was in the beginning was very strategic because it was next to Anna Crane's house and she was a big uh, activist in town. She was Israel Crane's daughter. And it was also next to the St. Mark's Church. And there's also uh, a stream there, so, you know, Possibly it was a way of getting there, hit you know, in a sort of covert way. Um, 
Here you have the presidents of the board. Uh, uh, it became the site of the uh, African American YWCA. Um, I feel that the most important figure in sort of the history of the YMCA uh, organizations is uh, Mrs. Tate, Mrs. Hortense Tate, who passed away a few years ago at 104. Uh, she was a community activist. Um, she was a leader in town for seven years. She uh, got uh, Langston Hughes to come to Montclair a few times to read poetry to the children. Uh, you know, she was such an amazing pioneer in education, and uh, her legacy is still here today. But I think that we have to do a little more work on documenting all the things Mrs. Tate did. <laughs> I love this picture. This is a picture of. Um, uh, the young women who lived at the uh, crane house in, in the attic, uh, they couldn't live on campus at the normal school, which is now Montclair State University, because of discrimination. But Mrs. Tate offered a safe place, safe environment for them to be able to concentrate on their studies. These are some exquisite photographs. I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, exquisite photographs of the atmosphere of the African-American YWCA and YMCA. We can go over these another time. I want to bring us a little bit more up to date. This is uh, Celebrity Minister Sweet Daddy Grace, uh, who uh, purchases this house, the Gates Mansion, uh, on South Mountain Avenue. This is designed by a student of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, someone that worked in his studio, uh, Mahler is his name. And it was the interiors were entirely designed by Charles Van Vleck, a local architect from Montclair, who designed Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomingdale's, B. E. Altman's, and all of Rockefeller's mansions on Fifth Avenue in New York. Uh, these are the Darden sisters who are. Um, who uh, have documented their family history with this book, Spoon, Bread, and Strawberry Wine. They have two restaurants in Harlem. Um, this is their house on Orange Road that's currently property of Senator Neil Gill. But uh, because their dad, uh, their father, Dr. Darden, was uh, the physician of the Cotton Club, this was a very, very f you know, famous house to go and visit. So you had Duke Ellington staying there. Sammy Davis Jr. would come, uh, Lena Horne, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune stayed there. Um, so she sold her property so that she could found her school, and the Dardens allowed her to live there. This is uh, Senator Mia Gill with Mother Lily Connor uh, from Frog Hollow, who founded the uh, Hollow Daycare Center. Uh, these are children of the center. Uh, there's a lot of residents in Montclair that were fostered by uh, Mother Lily Connor, who basically, um, she was a successful, a successful business person who um, had a beautician company, and uh, she was the daughter of sharecroppers from Virginia. Uh, they sent her to school in, Mon in Newark and to work as a domestic, and she went to school, to beauty school, and then became an entrepreneur. And uh, so uh, she lived uh, near to Frog Hollow and noticed that the children from Frog Hollow would walk past her house and pick everybody's flowers. And she said, children, you don't have to pick flowers, you're stealing. We're going to plant our own flowers. And that's how the daycare center basically started with uh, Mother Connor uh, mentoring these children after school. And it became a Kennedy project, so the government funded her uh, initiative. This is uh, Dr. Renee Baskerville, uh, whose parents were also very active in you know, local organizations, and Renee continues that uh, legacy of her parents and all the work that many people in Montclair did, and, you know, uh, Lily Connor. This is Reverend Elizabeth Campbell, a Montclair native who is the first female to be elected to the head of the Baptist Ministries Conference of Newark. 
she's a big mentor in town. Gil Noble lived in Montclair, and uh, I'm leading you up to the mural. Um, Don Mural, um, the late husband of Dr. Judy Miller, who is with us today, uh, was commissioned to do the Martin Luther King Freedom Mural. He studied art at Cooper Union, like I did, and uh, he um, had his first exhibition at the Crane House YWCA as a child. He wanted to be an artist as a child, and Mrs. Hortense Tate uh, organized his first exhibition. And uh, when uh, Don Miller was uh, painting the mural, he painted it on Bloomfield Avenue in a, um, a dance hall space. And um, Gil Noble, who lived in Montclair, and had a show called Like It Is. He was the fir one of the first tel television journalists that had, who was African American that had a show about current events. Uh, he, uh, they organized one day that uh, Rose Parks came to Montclair, and uh, uh, Mrs. Goodman, the uh, well, Dr. Goodman, the uh, mother of one of the slain uh, civil rights workers, uh, Ralph Abernathy, Dorothy Cotton. You know that was quite an event in American history, right here in Montclair. Uh, we will soon have that available to show as a tape. Um, and um, we're just very, very pleased that uh, we're so uh, privileged that the Miller family and the Rotary have uh, organized the permanent installation of the mural here in the Montclair Public Library to be used as a, an educational learning tool. Uh, this photograph is from last week, um, Mayor Jackson and Council woman Baskerville are presenting the mural and the Miller family um, and it, it's just such an, an important event and um, this is uh, Dr. Judy Miller and her son Craig that gave the amazing presentation that we have taped and that will be available to the public and uh, this is just about 10 years ago um, I was trying to organize the uh, installation of this mural somewhere in Montclair to be used as a learning tool. So I would like to um, I'd like to hand this over to uh, uh, Linda Cranston, who is going from the Rotary, who's going to present Dr. Miller, who uh, might have a few words for us. And uh, I'd like to thank you all. This is basically just an overview, and it's basically all that I could really say in this amount of time. And I would like to uh, be available to answer questions. If any of you want to meet me here at the library, just please contact me. And I will point you in the right direction of material that you might be very, very uh, interested in, in uh, reviewing. Jamaica and was brought to this country as an infant. He trained at Cooper Union and the Art Students League in New York City. His life's work was interpreting black experience in the United States, West Indies, and Africa. His oils and watercolors were frequently exhibited in this country and in Jamaica and are permanent in permanent collections at the Newark Museum, Smithsonian Institution, as well as other museums. The artist also produced illustrations for books at his Don Miller studio at 180 Bloomfield Avenue. As Mark said, the Freedom Mural is Mr. Miller's magnum opus, serving as a tribute and a teaching tool for an important legacy of American history. Montclair Rotary is proud to present this installation as, its own, as his own original markup used to lay out the larger mural which is now in Washington, D.C. at the National Library, the Martin Luther King Memorial Library. The uh, Montclair, you may see this up, uh, the, the presentation, the installation is upstairs towards the right on the side of the library, towards the windows. I'm 
we had a, this is installed in the library that was actually uh, the same library that Mr. Miller was the president of the board of trustees. The mural not only depicts major civil rights events, but also a visual history of Dr. King's life. Key moments include his graduation from Morehouse College in Atlanta, leadership during the Mon Mon Montgomery bus boycott, I Have a Dream speech during the March on Washington, D.C. in 1963, the march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, his Nobel Peace Prize, views about the Vietnam War. We are honored, as uh, Frank mentioned, to have Dr. Julia Miller, who chaired the Black History Department at Seton Hall University for 20 years and was a commissioner on the board, the governor's report on Newark riots. Dr. Miller, would you like to say anything? Please tell me if this is not on. Thank you. Thank you. I was listening to all of the things that were said today. I'm almost speechless, going from the early history of Montclair to the present day situation. And I couldn't help but think uh, about Montclair today, because Montclair is turning again to a segregated, segregated community. When we first came to Montclair, uh, it was a young family that sold us the house. And there were people in the neighborhood who objected and protested and got on the lawn and sang Old Black Joe. Uh, the young couple who were in the house called the police, and they sent a colored officer next door to talk to the people. And he said, do you realize how fortunate you are to have Don Miller come to your house and live next door? And the people who protested used to sit on their lawn and, and look at our house. It was a protest, you know. And they finally moved away. And the young people who came uh, were very different. And I still, we had the first black party in Montclair. Uh, and now it's filled with young people of mi mixed races and children. And so it's a different town, uh, a different street. So, um, and we had a black party recently, and it was filled with all kinds of people, and the Latinos who lived in the neighborhood who are still uh, uh, an integral part of the town. And there are just two families on the town uh, who uh, are prominent members of the town. Uh, and among them, I can include myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that it has become a a different place, and I hope it remains that way, because many of the streets that had been integrated her have been turned uh, to, you know, all white. Uh, and as a professor of black studies, at Seton Hall for 20 years. 
and listening to what was told today about the history of Montclair. Uh, I remembered all the students that I had. And I've been fortunate in having those students come back to me. Uh, and I keep meeting them in uh, strange places uh, where I've gone for therapy. Because <laughs> uh, uh, their parents have been in the same place of therapy and have come to see me. And some of them were uh, colleagues who came to my room and kissed me and brought other students. And there were other students. There was a young man who, when I walked into one of the uh, day rooms, he yelled out, Dr. Miller. And I looked around, and I didn't see anybody who knew me. But it was the son of one of the people. And it has gone on through years, as students have remembered. And in fact, I'll tell you something funny. Students call me from all over the place to tell me how they're doing and what they're doing. There was one student who called me from Kenya. And uh, he wanted to make contact with me. He had been a business major at Seton Hall. And he knew me well, because I used to have the African students come to the house. And he called to tell me that he was successful and making money and a school uh, uh, at a job in Kenya. And he said, and my boss is Obama Sr. And listening to you today, all of you, I have seen it as an extension of the things that I taught for years, and that you've added to it. And I wish I was teaching again so I could <laughs> add it. Uh, to what I taught. So I want to thank you for being here and listening to it and the things that you're doing. And Frank, I want to thank Frank for all that he has done uh, in bringing you all here and making it possible for my son and I to be here and to participate with you uh, and enlighten all of us. So I just want to thank you. I want to thank you publicly for all that you've done all that you've done, because he went from house to house on my street and gave it to my neighbors so that they would know what Don had done. Uh, and the, my neighbors came Wednesday to uh, see the what Frank has done. So I just want to thank you and all of you again. And good luck. Thank you, Dr. Melvin. Thank you so much.